Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to all of you for joining this British Chamber of Commerce um, webinar, um, which is entitled Planning for Sustainable Growth and the Future of Tourism in Singapore. Uh, and as someone that's just come back from the UK from a two and a half week break, it's great to see some of the restrictions at ease. So a really, really topical um, conversation we're going to have today more broadly. Uh, my name is David Kelly, and I'm the Executive Director of the British Chamber of Commerce here in Singapore. So as we build upon our existing chamber relationships with government, our new Bridging the Gap series for 2022 brings together businesses with government agencies, with staff boards and their partners to discuss topics of relevance and uh, potential commercial interest to the business community and the wider business ecosystem. And for businesses, this unprecedented access provides a platform for learning, for discussion and for engagement, while the government um, while this series with the government will enable stakeholders to build deeper ties uh, and on the ground knowledge from, from within our wider community. As a small city state with no hinterland, um, Singapore needs to plan carefully to optimise its limited resources to meet the needs of current and future generations. Um, we've got two fabulous speakers today. Um, we've got Miss Yvonne Lim, um, she's the Group Director of Physical Planning at the Urban Redevelopment Authority, or the URA, and she will talk to us today about how Singapore takes a longer term approach to balancing the social and economic and environmental considerations of urban development in planning and a more inclusive and sustainable future. So um, lots of really topical content there. Um, she's also joined with, by um, Ms. Jean Ung, who's the Executive Director of Attractions, Entertainment and Tourism Concept Development. Um, uh, and she will be sharing details of the active measures taken to ensure the industry's uh, viability during COVID-19. And will also highlight the trends and opportunities for the future of travel, the future of tourism, Singapore's continued investments in the rejuvenation of tourism development projects as well. Um, and in particular, I think we're, we're sort of keen to hear around some of the developments of the attractions in Jurong Lake District as well to create um, unique user experiences there. So um, ensuring, and this is something that the Chamber's keen on, um, making sure that Singapore remains a top of mind destination. Today will, of course, be another interactive session. So if you would like to ask our speakers a question, please do so using the dedicated Q&A box on your Zoom toolbar. There will be time for us to cover those towards the end of the presentations today. So um, without further ado, um, I would now like to invite uh, Yvonne Lim, Group Director of Physical Planning at the URA or the Urban Redevelopment Authority to begin the session with her presentation. Um, Yvonne, it's brilliant to have you with us today. Thank you so, so much for your time and over to you. Thank you, David, so much for your kind introduction and also to the British Chamber of Commerce for hosting us today. Now, give me a couple of seconds to just load my slides. I hope you can all see uh, the first slide. So thank you very much again. Uh, I'll just uh, give, us, uh, give me 30 minutes. Uh, I just want to bring you through what planning for Singapore is like, and of course, give you an introduction to Jurong Lake District. Well, I mean, URA is Singapore's National Land Use Planning Authority, and we envision uh, the sustainable growth of Singapore and we plan for it uh, from a long-term and also a medium-term perspective. And our mission is really to make Singapore a great place to live, work, and play. Now, I think David already mentioned, we are a really small island, a city-state. Uh, I mean, some figures there for your reference, but that's why from right from the beginning, we've had to plan very carefully and balance our uh, land for various needs. And so sustainability has always been uh, important to us. Uh, balancing economic, social, environmental sustainability, and also making sure that we make uh, optimal use of our land and sea space. Of course, going ahead, it's even more important to plan flexibly and also to build in resilience given the changing trends and the pace of changes that we had, had to deal with. So it was, it's important to us to always be innovative uh, in order to be able to make good use of our land. So we do this by uh, various approaches. I mean, one way is to co-locate uh, many of our users together. Of course, there are various benefits that come from that. Uh, you know, if you can put together various services in one building, you can save space. It can also maximize the, the usage of the space and you can serve 
uh, residents in a much better way. So I have an example there, Kampong Emirati, which integrates housing, social, healthcare, community, and retail facilities. Of course, infrastructure is another one where we try to put together, and this is the world's first uh, four-in-one depot, uh, three train depots and one bus depot together. So by doing, a, I mean, by taking a very innovative and sustainable approach, we try to make the best use of our land at the same time, uh, create a very livable city uh, for Singaporeans. Now we have uh, two uh, stages of planning. Uh, one is the long-term plan where we look strategically for the next 40 to 50 years. Now that's a very uh, long time frame. I, I think many would say, but uh, this is some, this is an exercise we have been doing uh, uh, I think since 20, 30 years ago. And we continue to do this. In fact, we are right in the midst of uh, one long-term plan uh, review exercise now. And through that, by looking at the long-term trends, we then think about what are some key strategies that we can uh, cascade down to the medium term, which we uh, look, think about in terms of 10 to 15 years. And that translates to the master plan. And this is a statutory land use blueprint, which guides our development. It shows, uh, provides transparency and shows the developers and uh, businesses where uh, the various land, uh, allowable land users are, the intensity uh, and the guidelines that come with it. And it allows us to plan very systematically uh, the infrastructure that's needed to facilitate uh, this plan. So the last review of the master plan was done uh, a couple of years back and it was uh, finalized in 2019, uh, just uh, maybe before COVID. But uh, I mean, we can see that a lot of strategies that uh, we have put out during this master plan are very key and we need to accelerate the implementation of these uh, due to COVID. I mean, events like COVID and climate change have accelerated change on many fronts. And thus we need to look at how some of these strategies, for example, decentralization, which means to put more work notes, uh, business hubs close to homes uh, would help us to make it more convenient for workers, allow them to have flexibility, allow companies to also have flexibility to be able to pivot in times uh, uh, of changes. So we are working on realizing this land use plans for the next 10 to 15 years. Um, in the meantime, we are working on the next review uh, of our long-term plan. So this has been ongoing for the past year or so. And as part of it, uh, engagement is very important. Uh, there are many forms of engagement that we do. Um, we eat polls with the public, uh, very specific stakeholder groups from the young, uh, the elderly, uh, and, and also to various stakeholders from nature to build heritage uh, interest groups. So as part of this uh, long-term plan uh, engagement, we have, uh, worked with various stakeholders to try to formulate a collective vision for Singapore. Um, and citizens have, uh, you know, uh, gave us the feedback that, you know, Singapore has done well in providing good transport infra, convenient access to amenities. And, you know, during the uh, COVID is, is shown, you know, it's even more important to have uh, open spaces, parks, nature, greenery, you know, to make Singapore a good place to live and play. And of course, a top concern about the future is climate change. Uh, we're many keen to see Singapore live in a, and develop in a very sustainable uh, manner. Um, so with that, we are formulating the strategies and we'll be going out to the public with a major exhibition sometime uh, in a couple of months. And uh, that'll be an exciting uh, closure to the long-term plan review. So as mentioned, um, there are various challenges that cities will have to face. This is just uh, some of them. I, I'm, I mean, the challenges are common across cities. But uh, the way we need to tackle the challenge can be quite different. I mean, given Singapore's context, we are small. Uh, the solutions that we have has to be, you know, adapted so that we, it, it works for us. But it's also an opportunity. I mean, we see it as an opportunity for Singapore to take the lead in some areas to be able to demonstrate urban solutions that can uh, be tackled and are used in other cities. So we continue to want to plan for sustainable growth. And one way we do it is to look at decentralization. On this map, you can see different economic gateways and key growth nodes. Of course, key to us is our central business district. I mean, we, we have established ourselves as a global hub and our CBDs uh, provides uh, uh, world-class uh, facilities and office spaces to be a financial hub. And of, uh, but to enable decentralization, we have also planned and also implemented various economic hubs uh, outside of the CBD. Uh, you can see some of this in uh, the blue uh, circles that we've 
be marketed there. Today, I'm going to focus to talk more about Jurong Lake District uh, because that is going to be our focus for the next 15 years. As I mentioned, you know, as part of the master plan, we look at how we want to map out our strategies and the Jurong Lake District will be our second largest uh, business not outside of the CBD and our key focus area for the next uh, 15 years. Uh, on this slide, we also want to talk about how we address various other concerns. One is, of course, uh, 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 various resources that we do not have, right? Like water, energy, um, I mean, land, I've already talked about it. So we've planned for water by looking at four tabs. I think you can see the, the four tabs here. We have continued to innovate and we have reservoirs. We have desalination plants and we have new water plants uh, that help us to ensure that we are self-sustaining. Um, so going ahead, uh, we are, energy is a, another major issue that we will need to tackle in order to go towards net zero. So as you can see, uh, well, Singapore doesn't have enough land to put a lot of solar panels. So there you go, you have solar panels on, on reservoirs. Uh, so this is a strategy that we will continue to uh, uh, implement. So very quickly, just co covering uh, some of uh, Singapore's whole of government uh, look towards how we can uh, move towards uh, net zero. Uh, our Singapore Green Plan were, uh, for 2030 uh, lists out some of the key focus areas and targets. Uh, you can see uh, with the image on, on the left, these are the uh, six key areas. And we have to cover a uh, city in nature, a green government, where the government will take the lead. Uh, looking at our energy needs, um, a green economy, uh, boosting jobs that are in the uh, green economy sector, plus sustainable living. I mean, we cannot run away from citizens changing their lifestyle, whether it's uh, uh, reducing their use of energy or recycling, and also ensuring that we are resilient. Uh, that covers uh, both climate resilience and also enhancing our food security. So I want to... Uh, uh, cover all the targets and details. They are actually made available on our Singapore Green Plan website in quite a lot of details. These are just some of the targets they are working on. And it's a living plan. We continue to improve on it. As we reach a target, uh, maybe earlier, we will, we will start to uh, put in place more aggressive targets. So I would like to now move on to the key topic of today, actually. Um, uh, is really to market uh, and, and to share with you our plans for Jurong Lake District. And to us, it's really a place to grow uh, for the next uh, 20 to 30 years. Um, and we have uh, looked at the vision for this new uh, district and we'd like to share with you what, uh, what it is. So this map just broadly shows you where it is. It's towards the Western part of Singapore. You can see the big bubble where Jurong Lake District is gonna be a mixed use uh, business district. Uh, the second largest outside of CBD is a convenient 20 minute drive to the CBD and of course 30 kilometers away from the airport. Uh, it's connected by rail. Today there is uh, two rail lines that uh, serve Jurong Lake District and there's going to be two more that will, uh, that's in progress of being constructed to link up Jurong Lake District to the airport uh, more smoothly and to other parts of Singapore. And it's close to two of our key top universities, uh, National University of Singapore to the east and Nanyang Technical, Technological University to the west, uh, which provide a ready source of research and talent. Uh, and our Tuas port, which is the world's largest transshipment hub, is, as you can see, to the west of this image. Um, it's, it's growing today. I mean, we are still building up the space and moving all our uh, ports that are in the city towards this uh, consolidated port in the west. So Jurong Lake District is located here, right in this uh, very central part of this Western portion of Singapore. It's located between Jurong Innovation District and One North, which are innovation clusters uh, for advanced manufacturing R&D and are popular locations for startup and incubator firms. So as the district grows, an ecosystem of innovation, collaboration and synergy within the region will emerge. And that's what we want to uh, capitalize on and also build. Um, and when fully developed, it can house 100,000 new jobs, 20,000 new homes, adding to the 1 million residents that are already here. Well, I mean, 1 million talent pool. So it's the, I, well, I, I suppose I mentioned this a few times, it's the next largest business district with more than 120 hectares of land available for development. And what is key is we're going to provide greater flexibility in zoning, land tenure, and uh, phasing compared to other districts to allow new development concepts and new innovative ways to integrate, live, work, and play. 
It is also right next to uh, Jurong Lake Gardens, our, uh, a major national garden in Singapore. Uh, parts of it, it's really open and it's going to progressively open over the next two, three years. You will have 100 hectares of park and greenery, a 70 hectare lake with 17 kilometers of active waterfront. And my colleague Jean from STB will share more uh, about the attractions around the lake later. Well, business sectors in the district today include professional services and construction, finance, insurance, information, communications, wholesale and retail trade, energy transport, storage, and sustainability. There is also a growing number of public administration and institutions looking to locate their headquarters here, such as the Ministries for National Development, Transport, and Sustainability and Environment. So the district is envisaged to attract a new generation of firms from the technology, e-commerce, sustainability, and business services sectors. It will be the epicenter to support talent and companies in creating new growth and new jobs in green innovation. But what is so unique about Jurong Lake District? Well, we would like to say that it's, um, uh, I mean, we call it the second CBD, well, some of us call it second CBD in Singapore, but it's more than just a CBD uh, because it's very unique in terms of its lakeside setting, the gardens that surround it, uh, the attractions that we are going to host here, and it's going to be inter intertwined with greenery and water. And in, our vision is really for it to be a model sustainable district working towards net zero. And because it's, uh, a huge portion is green fuel, we have not built anything that, that is the opportunity for us to uh, pilot new ideas and uh, set new targets. So here are just some snippets on the recent buzz around new developments and businesses uh, all within the last uh, one to two years. And I've mentioned our net zero ambition uh, going ahead. And we will have six key sustainability aspirations. But of course, what is key are the strategies that go into to enabling our uh, aspirations and ambition to be realized. Um, and those we are, are going to map out and uh, we will publicize some of these in the uh, months to come. So the developments in this district will definitely have green buildings. Uh, we're going to set a, a zero net energy, uh, no, Super low energy building uh, targets. Uh, this is under our building and construction authorities and bid, and they have mapped out some of these uh, roadmaps as part of the Singapore Green Plan recently. So the district will be also a healthy place. We will uh, uh, facilitate biophilic design to create pleasant indoor environments for better health, well being. Uh, of course, green roofs, uh, green facades, and well, I mean, it has to sit together with solar. Uh, uh, on parts of the facade and the roof to allow us to achieve uh, 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 clean energy usage. So, and the residents and workers here can be part of a green community that grows its own gardens, fruits, vegetables, and aspires towards higher levels of uh, waste reduction through sharing, reusing, and recycling. Well, in terms of uh, journeys, uh, we are really looking at seamless, driverless, carbonless. Uh, journeys. But I mean, for Singapore uh, as an island itself, we are already aiming towards, uh, um, I think, 75 to 85% public transport mode share uh, in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, what that means is that uh, uh, most of our public trans, uh, uh, most of our peak hour travel commuting trips will be based on public transport. So for Jurong Lake District, we are setting an even higher target. At least 85% of all of these peak hour trips will be made through walk, cycle, ride, public transport modes. And so all the roads are planned here. Uh, of course, we'll have cycling paths and will be well connected to public transport. Uh, I mean, we have mentioned there will be four rail lines that are linking uh, this district to the rest of the island. And transit priority corridors will also be planned where the corridors, there will be no private transport that will just uh, mainly be served by public transport and buses, um, buses, bicycles, and very easy pedestrian uh, uh, networks for people to walk around. And other roads will be lined with trees, uh, but the canopies will form green corridors that provide shade and act as nature ways for wildlife, enhancing Jurong Lake's district identity as a green sustainable district of gardens and waters. It will also be planned to readily support autonomous vehicles in the future when we are ready for both passengers and goods. And electrical vehicle charging points will also be deployed in all developments and public car parks in the district. New developments will also be designed to support emerging technologies such as the use of autonomous mobile robots for last mile deliveries. 
Now, Jong Lake District will be the focus of new sustainable development in the next two decades. So we will prioritize uh, certain requirements in the sale of the land uh, for this area. In fact, we are now building a centralized infrastructure, for example, the use of district cooling, which will supply chilled water from a few centralized plants to all the buildings in the district, rather than for each building to have its own air conditioning system. This will help us to save energy, lower life cycle costs for building owners and reduce carbon emissions. Another example is the use of common services tunnel and that system, which will house chilled water pipes for cooling buildings, telecom cables, power, power lines, portable water pipes, and pneumatic refuse collection pipes that suck waste from buildings to a centralized plant like a vacuum cleaner. So this system will allow us to distribute utilities to properties efficiently and reliably in a protected environment underground without the need to, I mean, maintenance will be easy. Uh, there will be no need to be digging up roads to replace uh, or to upgrade uh, piping. So walking will, will be very safe, seamless, and pleasant. And more importantly, from a business point of view, I mean, we see the district as one that will allow us to facilitate greater innovation to do test bidding. So to accelerate innovation, we are introducing new regulatory platforms such as the Build Environment Living Lab platform. This allows us to facilitate test bidding of innovative proposals, let companies in the technology and built environment harness and trial new emerging technologies in the actual built environment. This one-stop shop will allow us to smoothen regulatory clearance processes with the businesses and the technical agencies and expedite proposals for development. Some examples of new projects that are, are being piloted include autonomous vehicles, mass engineered temple buildings, horticultural waste to energy plants in the Jurong Gardens. So the dynamic mix of users that we will facilitate here will allow companies to conveniently co-locate R&D and commercial trials all in one place. This will help them to save time, space, and facilitate faster lab to market prototyping and scaling. Successful initiatives can then be deployed on the larger citywide scale. So as I conclude, I just want to map out for you that over the next uh, 10 years, we have already uh, see the completion of some of these new developments coming on stream. There will be a perennial business city. Uh, there will be super low energy business park. Uh, that strong East integrated hub, which is the land transport authority office together, integrated co-located various services. Of course, the, another new rail line is coming on stream with some stations in the district. Um, that's both the Jurong Region Line and also the Cross Island Line. And there are various ministries and governments that are in the process of studying and moving towards the Jurong Lake District. So we invite you to join the growing network of businesses in Jurong Lake District as we enter into this new exciting phase of development. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to me and hand this time to Jean for her segment on tourism. Thank you. Oh, thanks so, so much indeed. Um, that was a, a really, really, really great presentation. Um, if I just keep you on the line for a couple of seconds, because and just before we hand over to Jean, uh, you talked about how the last res review was held in 2019 and gave some fantastic updates on, on the Jong Lake District. How, how can businesses within our ecosystem get more involved more broadly? I mean, we, I mean, technology and innovation is a key pillar of the SG UK partnership for the future. So as a British Chamber of Commerce, how, how do we help disseminate this information to businesses that might be interested to get involved in, in the Jurong um, Lake District? Yes, um, so for Singapore, we have our two uh, key economic uh, agencies, uh, EDB and ESG. Okay. So they are uh, in quite close contact with the companies and we have also uh, looked them in to some of the progress and the changes. And we are in constant discussion with companies who are interested in keen. So we can link up uh, either directly to me or through EDB and ESG and we can have a conversation uh, on your interest in the area and what are some trials that you are interested to uh, uh, you know, in, uh, take place here. Yeah. Oh, that sounds great. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a what a what a great presentation and and always forward thinking as ever. Um. So really, really great to to hear that, Devon. Thanks so much indeed. And um, before we call you back for some sort of Q and A afterwards, um, I'd now like to invite uh, Jean Ung. Um, Jean, in my excitement, uh, a huge apologies. I think I introduced your role, but not your organisation. So of course, you're the you're the executive director of attractions, entertainment, and tourism concept development at the Singapore Tourism Board. Um, so I'm sorry, I uh, probably didn't. Um, introduce you correctly there and um, but really looking forward to hearing your sharing of the work that you're leading on to ensure Singapore remains a top of mind destination so Jean a very warm welcome thank you for joining us and uh, over to you thank you David um, let's just give me some time to share my screen 
Um, all right, so hello everyone. My name is Jean and I'm from the Singapore Tourism Board. Um, I thought we would start today's presentation um, to share about the future of tourism in Singapore and what kind of opportunities we can seize when the world travels again. But before I start, let me introduce a little bit about the Singapore Tourism Board. Um, the mission and mandate for the Tourism Board is to really create a vibrant and inspiring destination that we can all be proud of. And the Tourism Board undertakes many different roles and responsibilities to make that happen. Uh, primarily, we are a marketing agency, so we market Singapore overseas. Uh, we are also a champion of the tourism um, industry, specifically for myself, uh, we champion the attractions industry. And we facilitate the growth um, as well as attraction, uh, attracting uh, new tourism enterprises to Singapore. And some of the other roles that we undertake include um, as a planner, as a pricing developer, as a regulator, as well as an owner and operator of um, tourism uh, assets. Um, let me share a little bit about Singapore's tourism performance and some of our tourism products. So in 2019, we received 19.1 million international visitor arrivals, and these visitors contributed about 27.7 billion in tourism receipts. This is a 3.3% increase versus 2018 for visitor arrivals and a 2.8% increase um, versus 2018 for tourism receipts. Um, now for Singapore, our top markets are actually from Asia. Almost 80% of our visitors uh, visit Asia for leisure and our top five markets include China, Indonesia, India, Malaysia, and Australia. And 75% of all these visitors visit Singapore for leisure uh, with the other 25% visiting mainly for business travel, as well as visiting friends, friends and relatives. And on average, uh, visitors stay 3.36 days in Singapore. Uh, in terms of spending, about 20, well, most a, a lot of visitors spend on shopping, as you might be, uh, might be aware or it's intuitive. Uh, we also, they also spend on accommodation as well as uh, sightseeing and, and, and entertainment. In terms of the top five markets for visitor spend, no surprises that it reflects our top five markets for visitor arrivals. So the top five markets that spend include uh, China, Indonesia, Malaysia, India, and Australia. Now with about uh, 20, 21% uh, spend on uh, sightseeing and, uh, and entertainment, I think it's no surprises as well that we would then focus a lot of our attractions development uh, focus a lot of development uh, in attractions and is, this is indeed to increase visitor spend in sightseeing and entertainment segment. And we do that to try and create a compelling visitor experience, a diverse visitor experience for all segments of our visitors. And we have about 30 to 40 attractions in Singapore across these four categories, um, with the top visitors, uh, visitor attractions being the Marina Bay Sands, which is our integrated resort, Gardens by the Bay, Malayan Park, Sentosa, and our wildlife parks. However, uh, developing hardware alone is not sufficient, and we do recognize that we need to develop um, and promote um, what we call the software or the, or the animation of a city uh, in order to deliver a memorable visitor experience. Hence, uh, we do it in, in a couple of ways. Um, one is that we highlight certain uh, parts of our, let's say, our food story, um, our authentic experiences and events, as well as consumer activations. Some of the examples include um, a partnership with Time Out. Uh, we also created and partnered with the Craft Gin Club, which is UK's largest subscription gin club, to create a Singapore-themed Gin of the Month box in August 2021 to um, celebrate our National Day. And in terms of our marketing, we have a brand partnership with Disney uh, and we leverage their release of Raya and the Last Dragon to ignite the spirit of travel, especially to Singapore. Now I'd like to switch the focus to the present. Um, Singapore had experienced very strong growth uh, till 2019, as I showed you earlier. However, in 2020 and when COVID hit, we saw a decline in both visitor arrivals as well as tourism receipts. Uh, basically, our visitor arrivals uh, were decimated. It felt uh, it fell almost ninety percent, and it only hit two point seven million in twenty twenty. Uh, and we were very quick to recognize that we needed to sustain our tourism enterprises through this storm. And some of the things that we did um, included uh, restoring travel flows to Singapore, facilitating uh, industry and business transformation, as well as keeping up our marketing uh, internationally in order to retain mind share. We've announced uh, early uh, earlier 
or rather late last week, um, that we are easing the flows, uh, easing travel uh, into Singapore. And um, some of the announcements included the fact that you don't need to come into Singapore anymore through a vaccinated travel lane. Uh, basically, we have switched to a vaccinated travel uh, and we welcome visitors who are vaccinated into Singapore. And this is to make travel easy again as the world uh, recovers from COVID. Uh, on the business and uh, industry transformation portion, uh, we've actually introduced many different technology and productivity uh, initiatives to encourage our industry to um, upgrade and to be more, more productive, as well as to share data across the different um, parts of the industry. And in terms of Mindshare, uh, where you know, it was during COVID, we had basically continued our marketing activities in many source markets. But moving forward, we will be launching the Singapore Reimagines campaign in order to attract travellers back to Singapore. Um, I would also then now like to switch our focus uh, with travel opening up. We also need to start thinking about our future because what we do today uh, will help us thrive in the future. Um, before I start, I'd like to highlight uh, four key trends that we had looked at. Um, the first being remote nearly everywhere. Uh, with COVID, uh, it had really accelerated the idea of remote working and virtual events have also altered the forms of business travel. Uh, while many of our stakeholders have told us that nothing replaces in-person um, meetings and um, engagements, uh, we feel that there is a way and, and there is a, a moving trend towards how businesses are now conducted and actually you can conduct business anywhere you, in the world. Uh, the second trend that we saw was, um, and again, I, I suppose accelerated by COVID, is the idea of uh, holistic wellness. Uh, not just the physical wellness, but also emotional and mental wellness. And that's something that um, you know, has been, become very much um, important to people. And you've also heard it in Yvonne's presentation about having green spaces. Um, so that, that has kind of played uh, to us looking at wellness as one potential trend that we can leverage. Um, the next one is environmental sustainability. Um, we've launched, uh, Singapore has launched the Singapore Green Plan, uh, but this is rapidly also becoming top of my concern um, among travellers who view conscious consumption and corporate sustainability practices of enterprises as well as destinations as an important factor influencing their decision to travel. And the last one, um, again, I, I think it's no surprises, is that technology is now pervasive. It's everywhere, it's every day, and it's for everyone. So the trend towards using tech infrastructure to enable businesses to provide differentiated consumer experiences um, is going to be increasingly important in the future. And what we've done is really to, uh, is to distill some of these trends into opportunities that is available for Singapore in the next five to 10 years. Uh, one opportunity is really to look at how Singapore can be a global Asia node for business travel um, and reinforcing Singapore's position as the world's most trusted, valued, innovative and safe destination for business and corporate travels. Uh, we are also looking at creating an urban wellness haven where we offer wellness offerings uh, that is integrated into the modern, uh, or rather integrated into the daily life of a modern city. And that will be our key differentiator from other uh, wellness uh, offerings in the region. Um, we also see the opportunity to become a top sustainable and innovative urban destination where um, companies and enterprises can come uh, to develop and test bit innovative and sustainable tourism solutions and offerings. And lastly, with technology, we can also be um, uh, the place where some of these new technology uh, practices are actually trialed and introduced um, in terms of in the forms of uh, consumer experiences. Now, our vision is um, to become a top sustainable, innovative urban destination. And um, I'll be focusing a little bit about how the Singapore Tourism Board is preparing ourselves for this future. And it's through really building a strong pipeline of new tourism experiences investing in the future, uh, investing in the rejuvenation of existing tourism projects, as well as planning ahead uh, in order to meet uh, changing consumer needs. So let me first start with how we are const constantly investing in building an innovative pipeline of new attraction products um, to meet consumer trends. Um, the first one um, that we launched even in the pandemic last year was the Museum Ice Cream. So Museum of Ice Cream is a very popular US-based attraction that launched its first ever international uh, location outside of the US in Singapore. The Slingshot uh, was another, is another upcoming uh, new trail ride that will, re that will open in Clark Key. And lastly, uh, Sky Helix at Sentosa uh, was also open uh, late last year and it's an open air panoramic attraction that allow visitors a scenic view of um, Sentosa and the Southern Waterfront. 
uh, we also be refreshing our tourism precincts uh, in Orchard Road, as well as um, both our integrated resorts are also progressing on their expansion plans. In terms of future and long-term developments, we are planning uh, major developmental projects uh, in all parts of Singapore, and these provide significant opportunities for companies to inject new concepts into these spaces. So for example, in the north of Singapore, uh, we are creating um, the uh, wildlife, uh, Mandai Wildlife Reserve um, with uh, existing, uh, existingly there are already three parks there and by um, middle to end of the year, two new wildlife parks will be reintroduced re into the precinct together with an eco-friendly resort. And these developments will be open in stages uh, all the way from middle of this year to uh, end of 2030. In the south of Singapore, we've recently launched a new master plan for Sentosa and the Greater Southern Waterfront. Sentosa is our resort city, and we envisage that um, developments this, in this area will really play up the, uh, the ability for Sentosa to become the Orlando of the East. And in the west of Singapore, we have an opportunity to build a tourism development uh, in the Jurong Lake District, where uh, you have heard from Yvonne that we are putting on a lot of emphasis in creating the next business district. Um, just to share a little bit more about the Mandai Nature Park, it will be a world-class, eco-themed, family, family-friendly nature cluster with the focus of pro uh, promoting wildlife. Um, when it's fully completed, there will be five wildlife parks um, and uh, the introduction of two new parks, which includes the bird park as well as the rainforest park. Um, so I've, I basically showed you some artist impressions of what the two new parks will look like. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about the water, the master plan for Sentosa and the Greater Southern Waterfront. Uh, with the integration of Brani Island, uh, this whole southern part of Singapore now has an expanded canvas to attract new attraction concepts to uh, this area. And it could also leverage um, the rejuvenated uh, beach line, as well as the nature um, kind of area that connects to Mount Faber. And Sentosa has already articulated their ambition to be a carbon neutral destination by 2030. I wanted to zoom in on the west of Singapore and share with you the new tourism opportunity that's at the Jurong Lake District. Um, as uh, shown by the red dot, the Jurong Lake District uh, is located uh, next to um, the, the new science centre and it's ambitioned to be one of our next tourism uh, gateways. Uh, this tourism development uh, will form a leisure cluster together with the new science center as well as the Jurong Lake, Jurong Lake Gardens and complement the business activities that are happening and being developed um, in a larger Jurong Lake dis district area. Now the, Jurong, the site that we are releasing for uh, tourism development um, has many you know, um, positive attributes. Um, the main one being its direct connection to um, the city via public transport um, it's located directly in front of the Chinese Garden MRT station, uh, which will bring you um, to the city centre in under 30 minutes and to the airport in under 40 minutes. At the same time, being located in the Jurong Lake uh, district area, um, given its focus on sustainability, will give um, investors and opportunities to showcase capabilities in innovative uh, sustainability solutions. And lastly, being located next to the Jewel Lake Gardens actually gives the tourism development a 300 meter long waterfront uh, promenade uh, with expansive views of the lake, allowing a very good integration between nature as well as um, kind of modern development. And um, it also will have a, connect, uh, a cycling and as well as a park connector that weaves through the entire district. Uh, now, the two, I mentioned earlier that there will be two um, new attractions that will complement uh, this um, uh, new tourism development. And together, it will really form the leisure cluster for the business district. Uh, one will be the Jurong Lake Gardens, which I will share a little bit more uh, later, as well as a new science centre. Uh, for the Jurong Lake Gardens, um, it was opened in 2019, um, and already it has become one of the most popular attractions in the West. Um, it is uh, a 90 hectare uh, garden um, and it included uh, when it opened a restored storm forest and wetlands, nature team play area, allotment gardens and other lifestyle and sports facilities. Um, there are still going to be ongoing works to uh, enhance the gardens, uh, namely to the Chinese and Japanese gardens area which is right in the middle of the lake and these will be progressively uh, open in 2022. The Jewel Lake Gardens today already attracts almost 5 million uh, visitors and it's already one of the most Instagrammable spots in Singapore. 
Um, the new Science Centre uh, has a vision of being uh, the groundbreaking edutainment institute and it has a mandate of bringing science to life. Um, new, creating a new Science Centre has given us an opportunity to test bit innovative um, technologies in creative um, storytelling and to create a very immersive learning experiences for both visitors, um, local, domestic as well as international. Um, there is also an opportunity to utilise the outdoor space given its proximity to the lake uh, for outdoor exploration of science. And this will then allow the Science Centre to reach out to a larger segment of, of the population. Okay, so then now I will show you basically the site that is next to um, the new Science Centre and it's the site that we are opening for a uh, request for proposal, asking for concepts. Um, and as, as, first, as one of the first uh, tourism developments and hotels in the area, this tourism development basically is the first mover advantage in the Jurong Lake District. Um, we think that the hotel can capitalize on the catchment of um, business visitors that are going to be in the area uh, in order to um, provide uh, alternative accommodation options for short-term visitors. And together, collectively with the other two attractions, it will transform into a place to, wake, to uh, live, work, stay and play. Um, and with basically the whole um, business district coming to life, it will also create a lot of demand for uh, leisure activities uh, in, in, in this area. And this cluster would then be very well poised to tap on that demand. So our vision really for the tourism district, uh, tourism development, is that it should have a compelling mix of uh, offerings that comprise attractions, hotel, retail, entertainment, and public spaces. It's expected to set new standards by strengthening Jurong Lake District's positioning as a vibrant and exciting mixed-use business district and also to model sustainability. Um, it needs to excite and entertain. Um, we envisage that it will be a purpose of visit, uh, purpose of visit driver for international visitation to the West and it, has, it must have the ability to drive with repeat visitorship from domestic travel, uh, domestic visitors. And lastly, um, whatever concept that goes into this site will need to complement existing leisure offerings, which include the new science center as well as the Jewel Lake Gardens. Um, now, let me just uh, share with you a video uh, just to ignite your imagination of what the site could look like. I'd like to share with you more about the site itself. Um, the area is marked out in red um, in, the, in the picture on the right. And the total land area is about seven hectares. Uh, we are looking at lease period of uh, 60 years. And some of the preliminary GFA planning parameters are listed here, where there is going to be an allowance for a maximum of 84,000 square meters for um, theme attractions, hotels, and commercial GFA, uh, which is broken down in the table on the left. And some of the potential themes for the tourism development could include entertainment, technology, as well as a sustainability focus. And we definitely welcome a lot of content that is that's anchored on internationally renowned IPs 
or brands or actually our first of its kind attractions. Uh, we think that the theme or um, the focus of the entire development needs to appeal to a broad segment of audience, which includes families, seniors, leisure travelers, as well as business travel. And overall, the theme needs to be very cohesive uh, within the entire tourism development and across the other developments within the Drolic District. Um, so we referenced some potential examples, interesting concepts that we've seen in the UK um, that could potentially be implemented within the tourism development. Um, so attractions such as the Warner Brothers uh, Studio Tour, um, uh, the Sherlock Life game uh, in, in London are all, all very immersive type experiences that we think would fit well within the theme for attractions concept development. Um, and for the hotels, uh, we, we think a, a concept like the tree house um, in London would also be something that would be very useful uh, to, uh, and, and very suited for a development uh, within the Jurong Lake district. Um, and lastly, for retail, um, you know, uh, the icon outlet in O2 could also potentially be something that could be brought in um, to uh, Singapore and to the Jurong Lake district. Uh, we've recently, uh, earlier this month, launched a request for proposal um, to invite prospective developers, um, you know, concept owners, as well as, as investors, to submit their proposals to the Singapore Tourism Board. Um, the request for proposal uh, is basically um, a, a method, a way for us to tender out the site. Uh, and the way that we will evaluate um, the, the award of the potential concept would be based on concept first um, and then price later. So we will basically um, look at which concept best fits the site uh, before opening a price envelope. And some of the key dates uh, for this RFP are listed in the table below. Uh, we launched it earlier this month. Uh, and we will be closing the RFP on the 18th of October, 2022. We are looking to award the site by the first half of 2023, and we expect the site to be, um, or the development to be completed by 2028, which dovetails very well with the new Science Centre development, which will be completed around the same time. So um, I've come to the uh, pretty much the last um, slide uh, for, for me, and based and it's here to, um, to let everyone know that the site is now open for tender um, and we are looking for uh, concepts um, to come in uh, for, for the site. And if anybody here has, um, you know, anyone uh, is interested to hear a little bit more, uh, do reach out to us um, and you can also visit the website below for more information. Um, so we're definitely keeping an eye on the future and we invite all of you to be part of um, the future of Singapore tourism. Thank you. Jean, thank you so, so much indeed. Another, another brilliant presentation uh, and, and a great call for action as well for the, for, for the tender process for the new development there. And before we welcome back Yvonne for the Q&A, and a silly question if I may, um, you talked a little bit about the long-term tourist, tourism development projects and from a tourist, tourism perspective, is there a natural clustering of where international tourists come into Singapore and visit? And is this sort of part of a programme to to aim to sort of increase that spread of where tourists go in Singapore, and presumably that helps to increase their, their average stay uh, to increase that from 3.36 days, which, which I'm sure is, is something you're looking at as well. So how, how does that all fit together? Yeah, I know you're absolutely right. Um, I think today um, the tourists that come to Singapore are very familiar with um, essentially my backdrop, right? You can see the Marina Bay Sands, you can see <laughs> Gardens by the Bay. Um, I think they are really um, pretty much concentrated around the city centre. Um, and I think our larger strategy is to um, open up many parts of Singapore um, to showcase the authentic experiences that are available beyond the city centre. Um, and by doing so, we hope that they will extend their language stay because they now realize that there's so much, or rather Singapore has so much more to offer. At the same time, they would then open their pockets and um, spend a little bit more in the city. Um, so by opening up um, the areas in the north with the wildlife parks, um, towards the south at Sentosa, where it's a bit more of a recreational and um, kind of lifestyle destination, as well as to the west, where um, there's a natural draw of business um, and leisure travel, uh, we hope to expand uh, the footprint of tourism development across Singapore. Oh, no, super. Really, really, really great presentation. And, and Jean and Yvonne, you know, it always amazes me having been here for just, you know, just, just under seven years, how progressive Singapore always is and how, um, you know, some of the plans there are absolutely fabulous. Yvonne, it's great to have you back as well. Just, um, just a reminder for everyone on the call, this is sort of Q&A time now. So if you've got any questions you'd like to ask Yvonne or, or to Jean, please, please do ping them through on the Q&A function. But Yvonne, just to get things, get things going, um, 
what are some of the challenges in balancing sustainability and growth for Singapore going forwards? I mean, it was great to hear sort of sustainability in both of your presentations. Um, it was great to sort of see the Singapore Green Plan um, being promoted last year, and we were really lucky enough to have um, uh, Minister Grace Fu come and talk to our members about the, the SGP as well. So can you just tell us a little bit about sort of balancing that sustainability piece and, and how do you overcome some of those challenges as a country? Yeah, thanks, David, again, um, for this question. Well, I mean, uh, well, technically, su sustainability itself is not new to Singapore, but I suppose there's greater urgency now, uh, given the need to reduce our carbon emissions uh, and have an aspirational and a realistic target also to, to move towards net zero. There's also the impact of climate change on our small island. So these are areas that we really need to focus on uh, for the next, I mean, for this review and the next uh, planning review. Mm -hmm. So looking at that, um, I mean, energy is, is, a, is one of the issues. And I believe there's been some recent uh, papers and discussions on the various scenarios that Singapore can take uh, in this aspect. Well, from a planning perspective, we must be ready and available with a space to support the, um, the new generators of uh, energy or whatever it is. Uh. So from John Lake District, we are always in discussion with the Energy uh, Market Authority on what is needed, uh, how much space can be put towards solar, uh, how can district cooling help in the whole equation, whether there could be a separate uh, a grid uh, within a GLD cell, does it make sense? Um, so these are various uh, new ideas we are always uh, talk, talking with and we will see what uh, can be done. On the larger uh, island-wide level, I mean, we do have our uh, POV, which is looking at the, the impacts of climate change on our island. So we have embarked on various studies to look at our coast and how to protect our coast. So there are various en engineering solutions, but what is, uh, I suppose, unique to si Singapore is also the use of our mangroves, how nature can be integrated with engineering solutions to tackle that uh, and to mitigate any, uh, adapt to any uh, climate change uh, impact. So um, we will continue to, to look at various solutions, but from a, a flexibility in land use uh, perspective, we will want to make sure that Jurong Lake District uh, uh, allows for mixed users. So within the mixed users, uh, there's greater flexibility for people to pivot between one use to another uh, in the event of any change in terms of the environment. Oh, sounds, sounds really good. And another, another really silly question um, is, uh, we were really pleased to hear sort of um, uh, EDB's program around the Singapore plus one model. So using neighboring countries to help build different concepts around and, and attract businesses in to use districts like uh, like, like Zhong um, development as well. Is there is there sort of a really nice plan around um, businesses getting connected into the development here, but then also being able to sort of reshape that in the wider region as well? Wow. So um, I don't have the details of those uh, uh, proposal. But basically, I can imagine that uh, if you have a, a regional HQ here and, and you are connected right, to the rest of the region, we can tap on the talent always to here to generate ideas. And of course, uh, John Lake District is next to two major top universities. I think what, what is key going ahead is really innovation across uh, and, and um, solutioning. So if you can have have the academics, uh, the research talent working together with the companies to brainstorm urban solutions, then these are solutions that can be scaled uh, and tested in Singapore and then, uh, I mean, used also in other regions uh, around Singapore. I think you're right. I think that's a great answer as well. I think that's quite attractive for companies that have got sort of a tech piece that might sort of fit into part of what you're developing that might work might work elsewhere as well. And um, certainly after the COP26 discussions, I think that's that's really great. And just sort of staying with you, Yvonne, you know, how is the Jurong Lake District different from other key business centres in Singapore? Um, why should businesses sort of consider setting up an office there rather than perhaps in the CBD or somewhere closer to um, closer to the airport or woodlands, perhaps? Yeah, so um, as we are building most of this up from scratch, it's a green view, we can test new ideas now. So um, we want to attract companies who are really in the forefront in their vision for ESG so that they can come and partner with us and we can have an alliance towards meeting uh, higher sustainability targets together. Because on your own, there's only a limit to how much you can do. But together with the rest of the stakeholders, we can aim for uh, something greater. 
and you know there will be synergies across different companies. So if your your vision, you know, it's it's, it's such that lines with uh, our vision for sustainability, this is the place to be. Of course, second thing about CBDs uh, in the past, they tend to be more mono use. I mean, there will be the a greatly a great focus on officers and of course there'll be amenities to support officers but maybe a smaller stay-in component while we're trying to tackle that with our current cbd to make the changes and facilitate more lift in but it's much easier when you deal with a new new place to build in the mixed users right from the start so within each plot of land is already flexible in the sense that you can have quite a few different mix of users uh, whether it's residents or uh, service residents or even I mean hotels together with offices, retail, uh, all together. Uh, and with that, we want to also have some flexibility in our guidelines to allow uh, companies to pivot and change their users within a plot of land easily. And I've also shared earlier that we, are, we have a platform where companies can come and share ideas uh, and we can facilitate regulatory clearances in a much faster pace and to also look at parcels, smaller parcels of land that can tap on the existing and also the future spaces to do some test bidding. Uh, maybe talking about autonomous uh, delivery robots or uh, some other type of new technology that uh, not quite yet tested on a major scale, but maybe on a smaller district scale with a live in uh, and offices, I mean, workers working there, you can actually test the reality of that, that technology. Oh, great. Yeah. So that, that's... Yeah, so I mean, that way we hope to make uh, GLD quite different. Oh, really, really exciting. I'm, I must connect you to one of our, our one of our new members as well, who's uh, doing drone delivery as well for the region. So I think that that would that would really fit. And that's a really really nice segue, Yvonne, to sort of looking at the, the the different areas, the different types of users for that area. So, Jean, if I could, if I can turn to you, how will the future plans for the um, Jurong Lake District drive tourism demand for leisure and business travellers um, to that as a development. Is there is there a difference between sort of the local tourism and sort of the international tourists that you're that you're sort of trying to build with this with this program? Yeah, I mean with. Uh, realized over the years of developing um, and growing tourism that um, often the clustering approach works really well um, in terms of bringing visitors to a particular um, part of Singapore um, because it's in the west and not maybe in the area that uh, visitors typically uh, visit. Uh, what we've done is to kind of cluster our tourism development together with the new science center as well as the Jurong Lake Gardens and collectively this kind of becomes that um, purpose of visit if you will to the west. Um, and we can see that that is beneficial from, in a couple of ways. Um, firstly, it attracts the leisure tourists because the topics um, are quite complementary in that area. But of course, also with um, business district uh, being located pretty much just next door to the leisure cluster, it would also attract um, business travellers who may have finished their business meetings and um, require and would like some leisure offerings to then kind of hop over um, to visit um, the cluster of attractions and, um, and uh, experiences that we have to get, uh, that we're developing in the Jurong Lake District. And also, you know, with what um, the past two years of COVID, if nothing, uh, what we've learned is that actually your domestic visitors or your domestic audience is as important as um, your tourists. And we've embarked on um, you know, our campaigns to get our visitor, our locals to kind of experience Singapore differently. And I think that's not going to go away. And I don't think that's ever going to change because um, our tourism products cannot sustain solely your international visitors. Um, so we it would envisage that this cluster would also be a good way to attract our domestic um, uh, audience and get them to revisit uh, time and again. Oh, so super. And just, just sort of a, another one for you, Jean, if I may. Um, it's quite interesting, isn't it, seeing sort of the brand of Sentosa and the master plan, the brand of sort of Mandai Park Holdings and, you know, some of the other sort of a, um, sort of arty areas of Singapore. There, there does seem to be sort of a bit of a sort of a... Um, a differentiated sort of brand for each of those different areas. And um, how do you envision that the tourism development within um, Jurong Lake District is going to be differentiated from maybe some of the other areas in Singapore, some of those that we might sort of be a bit more familiar with? Yeah, I mean, I think you you um, have uh, kind of pointed out how we are looking at uh, different parts of Singapore and kind of having a slightly different focus area for each of these zones because um, Singapore is relatively relatively small and from a market demand perspective, I don't think we can accommodate um, all our attractions looking very similar. 
Um, so with the north and with the wildlife parks, I think there's a nice kind of cluster and focus on nature as well as sustainability and, um, and, and wildlife. Um, with the south, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we think there's also a, a, it's a very good recreational um, type of opportunity uh, where you, know, you could have more of the in parks um, and something a little bit more beach focused uh, in the south with Sentosa. I think in our central core, uh, with this business district, um, our current central business district um, is very much uh, built on what we call more entertainment type of um, attractions. Um, and also um, some of the more iconic ones like um, the Gardens by the Bay as well as Integrated Resort. Um, so what that leaves us with in terms of the Draw Lake District at the, at, at the west side of Singapore is perhaps to tap a bit more on the innovation angle um, as well as sustainability angle um, to create a, an experience that's a little bit more maybe other tech driven a little bit more immersive, uh, maybe pushes the boundaries a little bit more um, from a science and technology standpoint, given that it's next to the new science center. Um, so we think that um, the area could have a nice theme around, around that, that those four focus areas, also because it's next to our two renowned um, education institutes um, in, in, in the National University of Singapore, as well as the Nash, uh, Nanyang Technological University. Oh, brilliant. That's, that, 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 sounds, that sounds really, really good. And Yvonne, you've been really, really quick um, because I think um, Bickland, probably not your correct now, I don't think, but um, you asked around sort of building more hotels in parts of Singapore outside of the city centre. Does the cost outweigh um, the benefit? And Yvonne, I think you've, you've answered that really, really, really well there as well. And we do have someone on the call that's sort of involved in the arts in Singapore. Um, and so I've got a sort of question for both of you, really, which is as a resident here, there is so much culture and history of Singapore, not just sort of the past 55 years, but sort of beyond that, um, you know, are there sort of elements of building in some of the sort of the heritage of Singapore into this as a new district, or is this about really forward thinking? How do you sort of maintain some of the, some of the history and heritage bit of Singapore with, um, with sort of where you want to get to as well? Is that, is that always a bit of a challenge or is, is, that, is that the exciting bit, trying to stitch that together? Yeah, maybe I could start and Jean can sure. add on. So with the Drown Lake District, actually, there is a, a building that we are conserving. Um, so in terms of a built heritage, it, it is an icon and we have planned the site to, to showcase it. Um, and, and that's a, a sense of the built heritage that's there. Uh, actually, within the Drown Lake Gardens, there, there, there is this Chinese and Japanese garden that has... Uh, well, I mean, I, I suppose some Singaporeans does have some feelings towards it, right? Because it's been there for a long time. I'm not sure what we will retain, but I suppose uh, uh, that there could be something that we could build into the design, uh, mm -hmm. the gardens. So I think Singapore as a whole, um, while well, we have uh, um, conserved key uh, historic districts, well, I mean, from uh, Little India to Chinatown and Kampong Glam, um, and they are, you know, they resonate with uh, Singaporeans. I mean, really enjoy the spaces and they are also a, a, a hotspot for, for tourists too. I, I think going ahead, I think you've really hit the nail. Um, I mean, we are thinking about how John Lake District needs to also offer, I mean, first of all, I mean, we recognize our local food, right? The hawker culture is, is also something that we have uh, 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 built up and, and that's something that offers already a local flavor of Singapore. And that, that is what we also want to have in Jurong Lake District, you know, to, to give people a sense of uh, uh, what it means uh, from a, uh, uh, to experience that culture within Jurong Lake District. Um, over to Jean. Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, Singapore heritage, um, in both the built heritage as well as, um, you know, the soft, softer aspects of Singapore life, um, is definitely something that we want to showcase to tourists. Um, I, I mean, it, the way that we've really done it, especially for a lot of the tourism kind of purposes, tends to be uh, kind of the central area because that's where a lot of the conserved buildings are. And we've really repurposed um, some of those buildings to house, for example, our arts um, and also our museum uh, institutions, right? Um, and those become very key areas that we use to showcase uh, parts of our culture. Um, and if you look specifically at the Jurong Lake District, I think you know, in the Jurong Lake Gardens, there are certain built, um, for, uh, built features that we would retain. Uh, but largely, I think, you know, for, for the tourism standpoint, uh, we're not quite wedded to the idea that there must be heritage everywhere. And with Jurong Lake District, given it's a bit more focused on innovation, I think there are good ways that we can retain part of that um, heritage, um, that nature, but at the same time, make it modern and, and develop new innovative concepts that would leverage the environment it's in. 
Um, but from a tourism angle, I think you know showcasing the heritage of Singapore is absolutely key. Um, and the heritage goes beyond just what you see uh, in what's been built, but also in terms of the softer aspects, um, in terms of our food, uh, the way that we live, our festivals. And we can do that both through um, the built environment as well as through um, events and, and software programming. Oh, super. No, really, really, really good, really good to hear that. Really good to hear that. And last last opportunity for people to uh, to ask a question. If not, you get there about, about 20 minutes back in your diary for the day, um, which I'm sure none of us will complain about. But just, there was so much content there as well. If I could ask you both sort of a, a final question, which is, is linked to both of your presentations, which are number one around the top five markets for tourism spend, and the UK wasn't featured in any of those. And I appreciate the UK's sort of a 14 hour flight to where, not, not a 45 minute flight away. And I, I do appreciate that. But also with the opportunities from a URA perspective to really think about technology and innovation and bring companies together. And what is sort of your one or top Top, top three takeaways that we want this audience to sort of go away with because we're really passionate to try and help you to, to drive this from a, from a UK perspective. So are there sort of a, a top one or two or three things that you go actually yet, yeah, if, if there's three things to walk away from this presentation, it would be, it would be these three things. Um, uh, who wants to go first on that without dropping you both in it as the final question? Um, but there was just so much great content in there around the living lab, around the infrastructure piece, around the future living. There was some really brilliant forward thinking stuff in there. Well, first? David, you have summarized it so well, I don't know what no, to we... say, but um, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the key thing is really uh, Jurong Lake District is our next uh, focus, I mean, it's the current focus and the government is invested in making it a success and success from the perspective of uh, a win-win, I mean, both of the companies who are coming here to invest, looking for talent, uh, uh, looking to to research and, and you know uh, put in place new ideas. That's a place to be. Yeah. So we want to welcome uh, um, uh, all of you to come and join us on this journey to make Jurong Lake District uh, uh, successful and sustainable. No, fabulous. I'm very happy to very happy to share this with the wider network in the UK across the British Chambers there as well. So thank you. No, great great answer. And and Jean Jean, last little comment from you. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, for Singapore and for tourism, I uh, wanted to emphasize that tourism is returning um, and we are planning for the future. And specifically for the Jurong Lake District, that is the most immediate opportunity for investors, concept owners, as well as um, uh, developers to come in and shape a tourism future with us. And we are happy to, you know, do link ups. We're happy to do matchmaking. Um, and we want and we welcome any new or exciting and inspirational ideas and concepts to come in. Um, into the tourism site uh, for the Jurong Lake District. Super. So don't hesitate. Come put in your put in your proposal. <laughs> put in your proposals, and we'll we'll make sure that the wider network have got access to that. So, look, thank you so so much. Um, you know, if on brilliant brilliant presentation uh, from a URA perspective, Gene. Also, for it's great to hear tourism is coming back again. I've, I've been a been a process of that over the last couple of days as well. So it's great to see that sort of travel is going to start happening, and we're we're really here to support. And I think. You know, big takeaway for me is, I mean, again, forward thinking area. How do we get businesses plugged in? Lots of things around technology and opportunity as well around partnerships with businesses and thinking differently and um, and, and that sort of that sort of connected way of, of, create, of creating a more energy efficient space to live and work. Uh, it's been really, really great. So look, thank you both of you for your, for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. As you can imagine, I've taken, taken an awful lot of notes today as well. So thank you. Thanks so much for all of your sharing. And thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thanks, David, again for hosting us. Thanks. Really appreciate it. And um, so just just that leads me to sort of say a final thank you to um, all of you that's joined us here today as well. Um, we very much look forward to seeing you at another event. We've got some really um, sort of good ones coming up um, in, the, in the diary. We've got one around um, ensuring the energy transition happens around the region more broadly. Uh, we've got some cybersecurity essentials as well. Um, what you need to know about decarbonisating your organisation. And I think Yvonne, Jean, you might be pleased to know that we were, I think, the first British Chamber of Commerce to become carbon neutral as well. And we have a plan, so we take that really seriously as an organisation to try and help our members and our business community to think about that. And, and as we run up to our AGM on the 28th of April, 
Um, following the Committee of Supply announcements um, three or four weeks ago, um, we're really pleased to have uh, Dr. Tansi Leng, the Minister for Manpower, um, to talk more broadly around sort of um, uh, talent development here in Singapore. So some really great connected events um, um, coming up for you. And as Jean said, around um, you know, tourism is starting to come back on the radar again and restrictions are easing, um, so will our restrictions around the events that we're able to hold and have more in person, and it will be great to see more members um, with us in person and be able to see you face to face. So with that, have a great rest of the day and um, you've got a bit more time back in your diaries. And um, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks again to Jean and Yvonne for, um, for your amazing presentations today. That's been really, really excellent. If there are bits of that presentation you want to see again, it will be on our on demand section of our website and we'll make sure that members have got access to that as well. So have a great rest of the day and I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care, everybody. <laughs>